introducing our next speaker, a field medalist, Elon uh, uh, Lindenstrauss. Elon, as I know him, is no stranger to awards, nor is his family a stranger to mathematics. In fact, the name Lindenstrauss has been a distinguished name in mathematics for quite a few years. Elon's father, Joram Lindenstrauss, is one of the pillars of the geometry of Banach spaces, a field closely associated with the Institute of Mathematics at the Hebrew University, where Joram Lindenstrauss taught and Elon studied. Of course, Elon comes with his own credentials. Born in Jerusalem in 1970, Elon um, received his doctorate in 1999, working under the supervision of Benjamin Weiss. He spent several postdoctoral years at the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton and at Stanford. And, um, and currently he's at the Hebrew University, also completing a stretch at Princeton's math department. Elon's awards include the Nisayahu Prize, which is given for the best doctoral dissertation in a given year the Erdish Prize awarded by the <coughs> Israel Mathematics Union, and the Bruno Award give, excuse me, given by the Rothschild Foundation. Elon was awarded a Clay Institute Fellowship for the years 03 to 05, and he won the Salem Prize in 2003. In 2004, he was awarded the European Math Union Prize, and the same, in the same year, he received the Fermat Prize, the guideline of which, in my opinion, is ideal, the guidelines of which, in my opinion, are ideally fulfilled in Elon's work. Elon's lecture is entitled Dynamics on Homogeneous Spaces and Number Theory. Please, Elon. So thank you. I hope the microphone works. Seems to work. Um, thank you, Hillel, for the nice introduction. Um, as an understatement, let me say that this is a great honor for me, uh, both getting this prize and talking before you today, before a room uh, packed with great mathematicians, many friends, and maybe other friends uh, watching uh, over the internet. So I misled Hillel when he asked me about the title. The title is actually a distribution in homogeneous spaces and number theory. Um, <coughs> maybe a good place to start is defining what a homogeneous space is. So homogeneous space but that just means a space on which there's a transitive action of a locally compact group. Um, in other words, the spaces I'm going to look at would be of the form G modulo gamma, G a locally compact group, and gamma a closed subgroup. And to be honest, I would actually restrict myself further. I would take gamma to be a lattice in G, which simply means that gamma is a discrete subgroup of G, and G mod gamma has finite gene variant volume. Uh, here is an important construction how to get such quotients. You start with a linear algebraic group, say, of those rational numbers. So this just means that I have a group of matrices which is defined by a set of polynomial equations with rational coefficients. For the group G, I take the real points of my group. So all of these uh, matrices of real uh, numbers satisfying the finite set of equations that was a uh, polynomial equations that was given. In gamma, I would, for gamma, I would take the integer points of this group. These integer matrices would satisfy all of these uh, equations. Uh, or slightly more generally, I would take a finite index subgroup of the integer points of G. Then gamma is a discrete subgroup of G, just because the integers are a discrete subgroup of the real numbers. Uh, and often, gamma is a lattice. For example, this is true if 
the group G is semi-simple. This uh, type of space actually featured uh, in many talks, but in particular in, in Gold's talk, where he studied spectral properties of such G mod gamma under an additional assumption that gamma is nice, a congruent subgroup. So that's uh, essentially what Nikos Tokov was about, even though it was stated in terms of uh, Adele's. I'm not, my point of view is going to be different. I'm not going to study the spectral properties of these G-mod gamma, but the dynamical properties, or how I would study certain natural group actions on homogeneous spaces. That's the subject of homogeneous dynamics. Now, of course, if you study the same space from two different viewpoints, you have some uh, interactions between dynamical approach and the spectral theory. So one way, one natural action is to just take a subgroup of the group G, and it's action G mod gamma by left translation. Usually I take H to be closed, so as long as it's locally compact, I don't have to make this restriction. Slightly more generally, I can take H to be a subgroup of the skew product of the automorphism group of G and G, where I identify G with its action on itself by, by left translation. Then this group H acts naturally by affine maps on the group G, and as long as it preserves the lattice gamma, this action uh, reduces to an action on G modulo gamma. To make this a bit less abstract, I could uh, look at the subgroup of the, of the group of D by D integer matrices, and this subgroup acts on the toes, RD modulus ZD. So here the group G is RD and gamma is ZD. And in dynamics, what we like, what we study, is complicated orbit structures. So I only care about the case where uh, you can't quotient by the action of H. That H, the G modulo H modulo gamma does not make sense. It's a very, it's not a nice space in any way. Uh, so in particular, my group H will never be a compact group. Let me now give a particular instance of uh, such a quotient G mod gamma that will uh, play a particularly important role in my talk and actually also plays an important role in the subject. I already defined to you a lattice, but in the special case where the group is the additive group of uh, Euclidean space, uh, what this reduces to uh, a lattice in the space is just a subgroup generated by D linearly independent vectors. And two lattices are homothetic if they are the same up to a, a non-zero scalar. So I don't really care about the volume. I'm allowed to rescale the lattices, but the shape is important. And I take XD to be the space of lattices modulo homothetic. So that's the basic space I would use again and again in my talk. Uh, it is of the form G mod gamma. Uh, I could look at it as the quotient of the projective general linear group uh, with real coefficients divided by the integer points of this group. The projective general linear group is just a group of invertible D by D matrices when I divide by the scalar matrices. Um, and the, ident the identification you get by, if you have a lattice generated by V1 to Vd, you take these vectors, you think of them as column vectors, you pack them in a matrix. Um, the corset corresponding to that is going to be the element of PGLDR modulo PGLDZ that correspond to my lattice. Uh, I could also represent it as a slightly different quotient, as a quotient of SLDR modulo SLDZ um, either way, this space XD is a special case of this general construction I considered above. Uh, let me review some important properties of the space of lattices XD. Uh, more or less by definition, the projective general linear group acts transitively on the space. Uh, and it has 
the space has a finite uh, PGLVR invariant measure. This later fact is not a uh, triviality, it is actually um, okay, it's a theorem, and I hope I got the attribution correctly, so it's a bit, uh, I'm sure I would get comments that uh, this was known to Minkowski or to other people before or after. What's also important, so the space is not too big, it has a finite invariant measure, but it's not too small, it's not compact, and how do you see it's not compact? Well, let me give you a simple example. So suppose I take the standard basis of uh, RD, or standard basis of the lattice ZD, and now I construct a sequence of lattices where uh, I just rescale these generators. I uh, take a small number times the first generator and something big times the other generators, fixing the volume. So it's fairly clear that this cannot converge to any, uh, to any lattice. I mean, these are a sequence of lattices with same volume and with vectors which become smaller and smaller. So this is a sequence of points in XD with no convergent subsequence, so the space is not compact. This space of lattices is intimately connected to number theory. And I think the most important name or a person who made this connection between lattices and number theory is Minkowski. He introduced the systematic use of lattices in RD uh, and implicitly the space of such lattices to tackle number theoretic questions, a method he called the geometry of numbers. Part of the beauty of the subject is that this is not a theory about generalities. Study of very concrete dynamical systems, very concrete actions, can have meaningful implications. Another point I would like to make, it's not hard to establish in great generality ergodicity and mixing results for the action of an unbounded subgroup on, uh, of G, on G mod gamma by translation, so how Moore uh, theorem, the Martner phenomena. So, this is well understood, and what this means in plain language is that these results give me information about the behavior of a typical point under the action. So for example, uh, unless it's obviously false, it is quite easy to show that for almost every point in G mod gamma, the orbit Hx would be dense in G mod gamma once H is unbounded. But knowing something about almost every point gives absolutely no information about any particular point. And my interest shall be looking at results regarding the behavior of explicitly describable points, particular points under H. And one good way of obtaining results valid for some particular point is if you could prove, establish uh, equidistribution or density theorems for each and every point in your space. A notable example of this is Ratner's orbit closure theorem, which I would come to in a few minutes. I would like to illustrate these two points by an important example. Margulis' proof of the Oppenheim conjecture uh, in the mid-80s. It's important both because it is a beautiful theorem and a beautiful proof, but also because of the historical role it played in the development of the subject. So what is the Oppenheim conjecture? The Oppenheim conjecture is a conjecture regarding indefinite quadratic forms with real coefficients in D, at least three, D greater than or equal to three variables, uh, not proportional to a form with integral coefficients. So the conjecture is, which is probably due to Davenport, not to Oppenheim, in this form, that the restricted infimum of the absolute value Q attains of integer vectors is zero. So Q at zero is zero. That's why I put the prime there. The prime means that from the set of non-negative, try to use the pointer, from the set of non-negative uh, numbers, I take away the zero, and now I take the infimum of this set. So now the statement is no longer obvious. And indeed, it is not true if I have 
a quadratic form proportional to an integral form because then uh, once q of n is not zero it has to be bigger than absolute value than some fixed number examples such as a particular example I wrote here which is obviously not proportional to a rational form and not so obviously but with a bit of uh, it's an easy uh, riddle to show that uh, this quadratic form does not satisfy uh, the Oppenheim conjecture so that the restriction to at least three variables is necessary it is easy to reduce to the case of uh, d equals 3 simply by taking restricting my form to a suitably chosen three-dimensional rational subspace and what if I am working with dimension 3 three variables then there are not so many possible signatures the form could be so after possibly replacing Q by its uh, by minus Q I can assume that Q is the composition of some fixed form and I chose a particular fixed form uh, here and some element of uh, GL3R if I take C to be the lattice corresponding to this element G uh, more explicitly it's the lattice generated by the columns of this element G I, I have above then it is clear tautological that Q satisfies the open end conjecture if and only if the restricted infimum of the absolute value of this standard form Q naught at vectors of my lattice C is zero and what is important is that the right hand side of this equation this right hand side of the equation is invariant under the symmetry group of Q naught which I would call by capital letter H so in other words a lattice C satisfies this condition if and only if uh, HC does for any element little h of big H so in other words the open hand conjecture is a question about uh, orbits of the group SO12 in the space of lattices X3 now let me give a definition uh, if we have an action of Z or of the real line it is quite clear what we mean by periodicity more generally if I have an arbitrary locally compact group I would say that an orbit of this locally compact group is periodic if so the orbit of a point little x is periodic if capital H modulo the stabilizer of the point little x in H has finite volume and Margulis deduced the Oppenheim conjecture from the following dynamical statement the dynamical statement is that every lattice C in uh, the space of three-dimensional lattices up to homothety uh, if I look at this orbit the orbit of C under the group symmetry group of my quadratic form SO12 is either periodic or unbounded it could be both under my definition because uh, I did not assume that H modulus the stabilizer of X is compact the homogeneous dynamics approach to open and conjecture was suggested by Raghunathan uh, Raghunathan also gave a general conjecture regarding orbit closures of unipotent groups and of course as we all know Agunathan also organized this great conference with a man of many talents well deserved applause in retrospect one can identify a similar approach in a 1955 paper by Kassel and Swinerson Dyer which essentially conjectures this exact theorem that Mogulis proved uh, in a, a different language but what the insight that Gunnathan had which Kassel and Swinerson Dyer didn't have is the importance of unipotent elements and unipotent groups for the study of 
such orbit closure question. The above theorem was subsequently extended in several significant ways by Danny and Margulis. Um, so Professor Danny is also one of the pillars of Indian mathematics and he is the editor of this intelligence so also has a nice piece there. The last time I came to India, it was to honor Danny's uh, sixtieth birthday. So, so let me give, tell you now about uh, more generally about uh, Raghunathan's conjecture and its eventual resolution by Ratner. I've mentioned the word "unipotent" a few times. Let me now give a definition of what "unipotent" means. So, I take G to be a linear algebraic group over some field K. An element, little g and big G, is unipotent if, so a linear algebraic group is just a group of matrices. If I have a matrix, I know how to take eigenvalues. An element is unipotent if one is the only eigenvalue of this matrix over the algebraic closure of K. And the group is unipotent if every element of it is. Oops. So here are some examples of unipotent groups, unipotent elements. It's not so hard to diagnose these matrices and see that the only eigenvalue they have is one. And this group U2 is not a random group. It uh, preserves this quadratic form, particular quadratic form I gave earlier, and it plays a very crucial central role in Margulis' proof of the Oppenheim conjecture. Let me sort of a definition related to this definition of periodic orbits. A measure mu on G mod gamma is said to be homogeneous if uh, it is supported on a single orbit of its stabilizer, or in other words, if it is an L invariant measure supported on a single periodic L orbit of some subgroup L of uh, my group G. And now we come to Ratner's uh, seminal theorem, which established Sagunathan's conjecture as well as an analogous conjecture by Dani on invariant measures. The theorem says that if G is a real algebraic group, uh, and I put it a star because actually Ratner proved it in a slightly more general context, but I want to stick to real algebraic groups. H, a subgroup of G generated by one parameter in important groups, and gamma, a lattice in G, then any H invariant and ergodic probability measure on G mod gamma is homogeneous. There's only nice inv H invariant measures on G mod gamma. And for any point X, the orbit closure is nice. It's a periodic orbit of some subgroup L of G containing H. So any orbit closure is nice. Any invariant measure is nice. And of course, once you have such a powerful theorem, you could deduce uh, information about particular points that you might care about. This theorem has been extended to algebraic groups over periodic fields and to S algebraic groups, products of possibly different algebraic groups over different fields, by Margulis, Tomanov, and Ratner uh, independently and at the same time. <coughs> and this is not just a generalization for the sense of generalization, actually, some of the juiciest, nicest application of uh, Ratner's theorem of this unipot rigidity of unipotent flows use this S algebraic version. So, so much for unipotent groups. Now let me talk about a different type of groups, diagonalizable groups. So, again, G is a linear algebraic group, and now I take A to be a one dimensional subgroup which is diagonalizable over this field K. Uh, we understand such actions fairly well, uh, at least in some aspects. In some cases we understand better than others. But they behave in a drastically different way than uh, the action of unipotent groups. And a basic example which has been much studied is the action of the diagonal group on the space X2 uh, of uh, 
two-dimensional lattices up to scaling. So this flow is isomorphic to the geodesic flow on a certain orb default on a surface with corners, the modular uh, surface or curve, depending on your amount of sophistication. And uh, there's a very nice symbolic coding of this flow, which actually dates back surprisingly far. It dates back at least to the work of Artin, who used this symbolic coding to construct dense geodesics on uh, this orbifold. But has been elucidated in a, in a couple of beautiful papers by Sirius from the 80s, which really somehow nailed down, uh, dotted all the I's, crossed all the T's in this slightly elusive uh, relationship. And uh, this symbolic coding is closely related to the continued fraction expansion. Using this symbolic coding, one can construct points with essentially arbitrary behavior under the action of the diagonal group. So, for example, the orbit closure can be a fractal of uh, essentially arbitrary dimension in the conceivable range. Let me explain a bit how this uh, how this encoding works. So the symbolic description of a point of a geodesic would be a bi-infinite sequence of positive integers, the sequence ni. And we can attach to the sequence a geodesic as follows. So I use this data ni using continuous fraction to, to define two points on the real line. Two points on the real line define a geodesic in the upper half plane. This geodesic I can fold on to the fundamental domain of the modular surface. Now, of course, when I fold, I get many different segments. And uh, different choices of U and W would give me different segments. But if I do everything correctly, the different ways, different sequences which give me this uh, geodesic are precisely the shifts of my original sequence. And the dynamical properties of uh, the corresponding trajectory of the diagonal group are determined to a large extent by this uh, symbolic data, by this sequence and I. So for example, the geodesic will be bounded if and only if this corresponding sequence of integers is bounded. Because of the lack of rigidity that points, each point behaves in a different way, it is very hard to understand the orbit of a specific point. If I give you a specific point which is not defined somehow in terms of continuous fraction expansion, it would be very hard to say something intelligent about its orbit. So here's a concrete example. I take a, a lattice generated by the standard vector one zero and by the vector cube root of two and one. This is a lattice. I take its orbit under the diagonal group in one direction. So AP times this lattice where T goes to minus infinity, this just escapes straight to the cusp. In the other direction, uh, I don't know how to say much about this uh, orbit. So is it, is this orbit dense? Is it unbounded? Even that's very hard because this question of whether this uh, half orbit is unbounded is equivalent to whether the continued fraction expansion of cubic root of two is bounded. A well-known open problem. Let me give another more elementary example of a similar phenomena. So I'm just looking, my space is not a fancy quotient of Lie groups, it's just the circle, real line, modulo integers. One toast, if you want uh, to call it that way. And on it, I can look at the action of the integers. I can just multiply some number modulo one. And if I choose an integer greater than or equal to two, I could look at the cyclic semigroup generated by it. This certainly acts on the space R modulo Z. And the orbit of a point under this action is encoded in an obvious way by the expansion of the number to base Q. And using this expansion, this symbolic coding, again, you could show that there are points whose orbit closure is a fractal of arbitrary dimension or whatever you want to show. But what you can't show using this, which is sort of very hard, is to understand again the 
the orbit of particular point. So for example, uh, if I take cubic root of two and I take uh, Q to the N cubic root of two modulo one, is this dense in the interval zero one? I don't know, it's a very hard question. Now, let me talk about a class of system which lies somewhere in between. When I have action of a diagonal group, but it has, it's multidimensional. So, multi-parameter diagonal groups, such as the group of diagonal matrices acting on the space of lattices XD, where D is greater than or equal to three, uh, three and not two because I'm looking at uh, three by three matrices, but I am dividing by the scalar. So the dimension of the diagonal group in PGLDR is D minus one. So such multiple multi-parameter diagonal groups act in a much more rigid way than one parameter group, but they do not quite have the rigidity of unipotent groups. So they somehow exhibit a very interesting intermediate behavior which to a large extent is still on the conjectural level. And there are conjectures by Margulis, Katox Patsir, and of course, Philip Sostenberg, um, that gives that for this action, there are a few A invariant measures, and there are some restrictions, which uh, I will talk about, regarding orbit closures. So specifically, a clean conjecture is that in the space of lattices, any A invariant in the ergodic probability measure is homogeneous. And another clean conjecture is, which for which you don't need to know about measures or ergodicity or anything, any bound orbit of the diagonal group on the space of lattices has to be periodic. The second conjecture actually is dates back earlier, it appears in the same paper of Cassis and Swinerton Dyer from 1955 I mentioned earlier in an equivalent form. Um, so far for uh, sort of rigid behavior of flows, let me just show a few things in which these multi-parameter diagonal flows behave differently than, uh, than the unipotent flows. So, it is not true that the orbit closures have to be nice. Sort of, Mary Reese understood one very important way in which this can fail in 1982, quite early on. A more complicated behavior was exhibited recently by uh, Uri Shapira, I guess the person who started the recent, uh, these recent more, slightly more uh, elaborate examples is Makurant. There's also some related work of Tomanov. Another difference is the following. So let me first of you some property of uh, unipotent groups or groups generated by unipotent, which I have not talked about so far. So if I have a sequence of, of uh, H periodic measures where H is a group generated by unipotents and a periodic measure, so by this I mean the natural measure on a periodic H orbit has a natural way a volume. So if I have a sequence of such measures with volume going to infinity, then these measures would tend to the uniform measure unless there's some obvious algebraic obstruction. That's the theorem of Moses and Shah and is based on Ratner's measure classification theorem. This is absolutely not true for the action of the diagonal group on the space of lattices. You have sequence of periodic uh, orbits of volume going to infinity so that the associate measures do not go converge to the uniform measure without any algebraic reason. And, okay, this is sort of one comment in a long paper by Einsiedler, Michel, and Katesh and myself. Uh, but it's actually, you could find it uh, implicitly in an old paper of Cassels. And Again, like we had in the one parameter case, let me give you the two parameter analog in this more elementary context of dynamics on the unit interval on R modulus Z. Well-known example, so 
let me first start with the definition. Two integers, A and B, are multiplicatively independent if the ratio of the logarithms is irrational. In other words, they're not both powers of the same integer. In this case, they generate a semigroup, which is not cyclic, and this acts on R modulo Z in the obvious way. And uh, in 1967, three years before I was born, Hillel proved the following theorem, that for any point X in R modulo Z, the orbit of X under this uh, semigroup is either finite or dense. As this is again in stark contrast to the case of a cyclic group. He also made a conjecture, which to date is still open, that any measure ergodic and invariant under the semigroup is either Lebesgue measure or a finitely supported periodic measure or rational. Conjectures are all still open, but there's some progress towards them, which I would like to uh, report to you. Much of the progress, somewhat surprisingly, involves a seemingly unrelated quantity, uh, which is called ergodic theoretic entropy or Kolmogorov Sine entropy after it's, uh, the people who introduced this important concept. Since perhaps not all of you uh, are very familiar with ergodic theory and ergodic theoretic entropy, though you should, um, these results can also be formulated in terms of house of dimension, which is more, uh, more widely known concept. So here is the basic, here is the theorem uh, from the 90s, I believe, Rudolf, uh, Rudolf and Johnson. So let A and B be multiplicatively independent integers. Sigma AB is a group generated by A and B. And mu, uh, sigma AB invariant and ergodic probability measure. Now assume that it has positive entropy under the one map x goes to ax modulo one. Then mu is a Lebesgue measure. I promised I could translate things in terms of house of dimension, let me do so. So I replace the entropy condition by the condition that for any set of positive measure has positive house of dimension. And if I phrase things this way, I do not need to make an ergodicity assumption, so I now have uh, a statement of Rudolf's, Rudolf Johnson's theorem, which is, uh, does not involve any concepts from ergodic theory. Uh, I forgot to mention that Rudolf uh, and Johnson's result was preceded by an important result of Lyons, partial, weak result, but in, in this general direction. Katok Spazio uh, extended this theorem into many contexts, and I also mentioned the name of Kalinin, who with Katok uh, further developed their method and clarified some aspects which were not uh, too clear. And for example, they could extend these methods to many actions of ZK on TD by toral automorphism. So if you have K independent D by D integer matrices, they generate a ZK action on the D dimensional toad. And they also extended this type of theorem to uh, homogeneous quotients G mod gamma. But here there is some fine point. The fine point is that they need to assume some ergodicity of certain sub actions. Uh, an assumption which, though could be said to be perhaps natural in some contexts, uh, is virtually impossible to verify in the context of number theoretic applications. And I would mention that the general case of ZK actions on TORI has been handled by Einsiedler and myself, and there's sort of one extra ingredient an entropy inequality for single toral automorphisms, which could perhaps be of independent interest. I don't know how many people have looked into that. 
but now let me return to actions of subgroups of uh, to actions on the space of lattices XD. So A for me is going to be the group of diagonal matrices as before. And let mu be an A invariant and ergodic probability measure on the space of lattices. Satisfying an entropy or dimension condition uh, like we see here, there are many languages. Every sign is written in uh, various, uh, in English, in Hin Hindu, in uh, various languages. I write to you here the condition in two languages. So in terms of entropy, for some element A in the action of the diag in the diagonal group, the entropy of mu with respect to the action by translations of this element A is positive or an equivalent condition that the dimension of any set of positive measure is strictly bigger than the dimension of the acting group. Then mu is homogeneous, a nice measure, measure on a periodic orbit of some group which contains A. And moreover, this you get by just analyzing um, more or less a case-by-case -case analysis, the support of mu has to be unbounded. This is a partial result of the measure classification conjecture. I said earlier, and it implies the partial result of this conjecture about bounded orbit. It says that if you have a A invariant compact subset in the space of lattices, then the Minkowski dimension of the set is the smallest it could be D minus one. The theorem is proved by combining two ingredients which were developed independently one by Angela and Katok and one by myself. One is called the high entropy method. Um, maybe to save time, I won't go into the details of what's written here, but their method involves, or I would say something, involves a careful analysis of um, the measures you get by restricting your measure on unstable foliations of the group. And it can be used to classify invariant measures by itself if the measure has sufficiently high entropy. The second, the second uh, ingredient is sort of very different. Basically, what it says is we want to study a measure invariant under certain diagonal group. This diagonal group we don't understand so well. We have many works which analyze action of unipotent groups. These we understand very well. Of course, my measure has nothing to do with the unipotent group, but we like the unipotent uh, dynamics so much better than that of the diagonal group that we just forget what was the question we were asked, like uh, politicians do when they talk to journalists, and we use the uh, unipotent dynamics uh, disregarding using some ideas from Ratner's earlier work on uh, horror cycle flow. And somehow a positive entropy assumption is exactly what allows you, what allows you to do this, what makes this legitimate somehow. And it gives a complete analog of Rudolf theorem in some simple cases, exactly the cases that this other method cannot handle. But uh, these two ingredients sort of work best together. They complement each other nicely. So let me now say a few words about the general picture. I started with a more general framework. Let me talk about the general picture. So I start with a semi-simple real algebraic group of real rank at least two. That is to say it has a subgroup diagonalizable over the real numbers of dimension at least two. And A is such a uh, subgroup, actually it needed to be a maximal R diagonalizable subgroup. Gamma an irreducible lattice, which just means that if G is a product of uh, smaller groups, then gamma is not going to be uh, also of product type. Let mu be an A invariant and ergodic probability measure on G mod gamma. Assume that this measure mu uh, does not leave on any smaller uh, 
it's really some measure on G mod gamma. It doesn't live on something smaller. It doesn't live on a periodic orbit of a smaller reductive group. And there's some entropy. Then mu is uniform measure on a connected component of G mod gamma. And if the first condition is not satisfied, then basically you live in a smaller group. Um, so you're basically your measure is on L modulo lambda for some lattice lambda and some smaller group L. Lambda might not necessarily be reducible, but you could uh, decompose to uh, 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 this quotient to a reducible quotient and try to apply the theorem inductively and you could get a more explicit but less concise statement which you don't want to give. Conjecturally, in our theorem, this assumption of entropy is redundant. Um, regarding orbit closures, there has been some, have been some conjectures, the most explicit of which has been by Margulis. This is somehow uh, seems to need some further tweaking. I would like to propose as a tentative conjecture this following conjecture, which actually follows suggestions by Tomanov. Tomanov uh, recently in a conference at Oberwolf has suggested some conjecture. This is my adaptation of his conjecture. So if it's true, you could uh, attribute it to him. And if it's false, that's my fault. Uh, so let G, A, and gamma be as above. So sim G is semi-simple. A, maximum diagonalizable subgroup, gamma lattice, irreducible lattice, and take orbit closure of a arbitrary point. Then either this orbit closure is basically the connected com a connected component of G modulo gamma, or when I take the orbit closure, subtract the original orbit, it's contained in a union of finitely many closed orbits of strictly smaller subgroups. So now some applications, and as I sort of expected, I don't have time to discuss. I have three applications, but I don't have time to discuss them. Uh, one of them, which is regarding a partial result toward Littlewood's conjecture. So Littlewood's conjecture states that uh, for any A and B, the, you could find non-zero integers n so that n times the distance of an A to the closest integer times the distance of nb to the closest integer is zero. And using these techniques, we were, Einzidler, Katok, and myself were able to show that this fails at most on a set of Hausdorff dimension zero. And this set is actually quite explicit in a sense. But let me skip that. Uh, there's another application regarding periodic orbits of the diagonal group, which is joint work of, with uh, Einziegler, Michel, Ben Katesh, um, which is actually quite closely connected to many questions in automorphic forms. Uh, it connects quite nicely to uh, some uh, issues which were briefly touched upon in the ghost talk. But again, I'm going to skip this. And I reached my third application, uh, arithmetic quantum ergodicity, um, which uh, some of you might have heard in uh, Sundararajan's excellent talk on Sunday, I believe. Incidentally, there was another talk on Sunday closely related to my talk by my uh, collaborator in many projects, Einzigler. Uh, unfortunately, these two talks, which are both closely related to what I'm talking about today, were at the same time, so it's unlikely many of you went to both of these talks. So, this, there was a conjecture by Rudnik and Sarnak, a very nice conjecture, which I don't have time to motivate, but those of you who went to Sundararajan's talk have seen a motivation which states that if I have a compact Riemannian manifold of negative sectional curvature, then I could look at, uh, because it's compact, L2 of my manifold is spanned by eigenfunctions of Laplace. In particular, there are many eigenfunctions of Laplace on this manifold. And I can take some orthonormal sequence of eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. And then for any test function f, 
if I integrate f with the density given by these uh, eigenfunctions of the Laplacian, this would converge to the normalized, to the integral of f with respect to normalized volume on m. That's a very general conjecture. It has a stronger form when the test function is allowed to be in phase space, a function on the unit tangent bundle of m instead of an m. Uh, but this form would suffice for our purposes. And, okay, for the general conjecture, I'm afraid I can't say much, but there's a special case for which I can say a few things. The special case is quotients of the hyperbolic plane, where a quotient not by an arbitrary lattice, but a lattice which comes from arithmetic. An arithmetic lattice of congruence type, either a congruence sub lattice of PGL to Z, or a certain lattice, or certain lattices which come from uh, quaternion algebras, which you could just think of as compact uh, cousins of PGL to Z. So in this case, there's extra symmetry. There are Hecke operators. There are operators on L2 of M which commute with each other and with the Laplacian. There are actually quite many of them. For every prime P, there's a essentially different operator. So you have somehow an infinite collection of symmetries. And as any physicist know, when you have symmetry, this is something nice. This is a good thing. This is, could help you. And it does help indeed in this case. As it turns out, you don't need to use all of this great wealth of symmetry. Just one Hecke operator is enough. So here's a theorem by Shimon Brooks and myself. Uh, though it sort of refines the previous theorem by Bourguin and myself. So suppose I take a arithmetic quotient of this type and I also assume it's compact and I take a sequence of joint eigenfunctions of the Laplacian and one Hecke operator, then they would satisfy the quantum unique ergodicity conjecture. Then when I take a test function integrated with respect to that, such a sequence of functions, I would tend to the uh, average of f. When gamma is not co-compact, when gamma is a congruent subgroup of s to z, there's an extra complication. One needs to show that no extra, that there's no mass escape to the cusp in the limit. And under the assumption of phi being joint eigenfunctions of all Hecke operators, this has been established by Sundar Arjan. Let me make one short comment. If you work on this quantum unique ergodistic conjecture, so you need to fight an arbitrary eigenfunction of the Laplacian. Uh, if the spectrum is simple, basically it's just a countable sequence of functions you need to show is well behaved. If you have large degeneracies in the spectrum, then some evil adversary might choose to take out of this large space some particular function which would be bad for you. Um, though in practice, one expects, it's sort of strongly conjectured that the spectrum of the Laplacian on such surfaces is of bounded multiplicity, which is almost as good as being uh, simple. That's nowhere near to be known and while if you take joint eigenfunctions of one Hecke operator on the Laplacian, multiplicity is, uh, you could get a bit better multiplicity bounds. Still, as far as I know, the bounds of uh, multiplicity are not very good. If you assume that you have your joint eigenfunction of all Hecke operators, then actually there's uh, multiplicity is essentially one. Now, as Sandrarajan explained in his beautiful talk. Um, with Holowinski, they developed an alternative approach, but and this alternative approach is essentially different. It has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, okay, let's start with the disadvantage because that's what's written earlier. It requires assuming a Manugian conjecture, knowing that the eigenfunctions of uh, all Hecke operators are in some uh, uh, what you would expect them to be, which is not known in this context, in the context of eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. But 
Ramanujan conjecture is known for holomorphic as form, an analogous situation, different but analogous situation. And Olowinski and Sandraj have been able to prove some analog to arithmetic quantum unique ergodicity in this holomorphic case to which our method does not apply. Now you might wonder what's the connection between uh, quantum unique ergodicity or even arithmetic quantum unique ergodicity to what I've discussed earlier. And this is well warranted. And to be honest, in a strict sense, it's not connected. Uh, what is needed for this application is a variant, which I would call here, uh, maybe as half joke, uh, rigidity of one and a half parameter diagonalizable action. So somehow, it's not so surprising when you study some eigenfunctions of Laplacian. A physicist would tell you you're studying the quantum mechanics of the system. A physicist would tell you that you should look at phase space, that somehow the geodesic flow on the surface would be relevant. So somehow, one parameter action is no surprise. There's some e extra half parameter which comes from this Hecke operator, which uh, I would like to explain. And you also need some entropy assumption, but you could verify that using, actually that's another connection to an earlier talk of one of the prize winners of Dan's film and talk. Uh, you actually use some properties of eigenfunction of the discrete Laplacian on graphs. Um, there are also beautiful general results of Anand Saruman and Nonnemacher um, about entropy of measures that are associated with this type of procedure with getting a, uh, which you could get from this type of procedure from sequence of eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. These general results sort of are very nice that they sort of show what you get just from the anostal fact that the systems we are considered are anostal flows. But uh, they are not sufficient for our purposes. They do not rule out that uh, mu gives positive measure to a single periodic geodesic. Nonetheless, they are beautiful results and they are very, very general. So what do I did I call rigidity of one and a half parameter action? What is this half parameter? So let me give a general definition, sort of absurd generality. So I have a locally compact space, a group which uh, acts on the space and the measure of the space. Then this measure is said to be H recurrent if for any set of positive measure, for almost every point X in the set B, this is a typo, the set of uh, elements of the group, H in H, which uh, take you back to the set B, is unbounded, has non-compact closure. That's a general definition. Definitely it's satisfied if mu is H invariant and H is not a compact group. And uh, the one and a half parameter rigidity theorem in a simple case is that if I take G to be a product of PGL2R times PGL2QP, H, this piadic group, considered as the subgroup of the big group, A1, the diagonal subgroup of the real group, considered as the subgroup of the big group, and capital lambda, a lattice in G, an irreducible lattice, then any probability measure on G mod lambda, which, has, which is A1 invariant, H recurrent, recurrence is less than invariant, so this is my half parameter, and has some positive entropy assumption is the uniform measure on G modulo lambda, and I'm cheating here a bit because of its finite index issues that uh, I was a bit more careful about earlier, but in the last minutes, I'm allowed to be a bit less careful. So, let me talk a bit about quantitative aspects. So dynamical techniques applied in the context of genius spaces can be extremely powerful. They have uh, many applications in number theory and other subjects, but they have one disadvantage. They can be, they're quite hard to quantify. So Margulis proved the Oppenheim conjecture, but he does, this proof does not give you any information about the, if you have a given indefinite quadratic form, doesn't give you any information about the size the smallest v for which q of v is less than epsilon. Uh, on the other hand, the general tools of 
usually tools on Mambo still usually come with an uh, estimate attached. So for example, Dave, Davenport and Helbron uh, proved quite early in 1946 the Oppenheim conjecture for diagonal forms with D at most at, at least five variables. And they gave a quantitative estimate of the size of the smallest vector for which Q of is less than epsilon. So that's sort of a very interesting direction um, of research. A very interesting and very active direction of research in the homogeneous dynamics. There's one general class which, at least in principle, uh, it has long been known that you could get sharp quantitative, fairly sharp quantitative equity distribution statements, action of a spheric group. For a spheric group, a group is a special kind of unipotent group which you obtain as a group of elements contracted by a single element of your bigger group. And I gave you some examples. There's a work of Sarna from 81, which gives a very quantitative, almost sharp uh, uh, equidistribution results of, of for a spheric group in the simplest case here. Actually, Sarnak also connects these equidistribution questions to uh, the Riemann hypothesis, if you want an unusual angle of attack to the Riemann hypothesis. Um, but even in this well understood case, I mean, this quantitative equidistribution results have remarkable applications of work of Michel and Venkatesh and subconvex estimates and L functions. Um, okay, let me skip a bit more. There's also a uh, quantitative version of uh, Fersenberg theorem about density of A to the N, B to the K, X modulo one. Um, so in particular, from Fersenberg theorem, you could deduce that if you have a rational point of high denominator, its orbit would be quite dense. And this gives a quantitative statement to this effect. Um, which is somehow two logs of being optimal. And improving this is quite an interesting uh, open problem. Using the techniques of arithmetic combinatorics, you could get in the non-commutative case, so if you have a subgroup of SLDZ, which uh, generates the Varitsky dense subgroup, um, and you look at all words of size, say logarithm in L, in of, of elements of S and apply it to some fixed uh, rational vector, then this would be uh, N to the minus theta dense, which is essentially up to the value of theta, this is sharp. So this, you could get using the techniques of, the tools of arithmetic combinatorics are very powerful and allow you to get actually, at least in this case, it's almost in some sense sharp results. And I, I, one reason I'm mentioning this result is first because, okay, I, li I like it, but also because it gives me an, a platform to mention some work I'm very excited about, work of Benoit and Quant, who made an exciting progress in studying qualitative studies in the study of, in the qualitative study of such random works. And, okay, I started with Oppenheim conjecture. I finished with Oppenheim conjecture. So with Margulis, we have uh, given a quantitative form of the open conjecture, which um, actually gives a bound. So there's, there's a different proof. It's a different proof, which is close to Margulis' original proof, but it's different. And uh, it allows us to show that you have a vector of size at most t, so that your quadratic form at v is less than log t to the minus theta. Um, a few more words, but maybe it's a good place to stop. Thank you. Thank you, Alon, for a fascinating lecture. Thank you.